evening, everybody, and welcome to our diocesan talk. My name is Madeleine Straczynski, and I am the Director of Communications for the Diocese, and I'm delighted that tonight we are welcoming Baroness Gray Thompson to address the question, is assisted dying a small victory for personal autonomy or a big loss for civil society? Assisted dying is particularly pertinent at present as the House of, House of Lords is due to, due to hear the second reading of the Assisted Dying Bill sponsored by Baroness Meacher on October 22nd this year. And this week, the bishops of England and Wales have urged all Catholics to acquaint themselves with the issues and to write to parliamentarians expressing their concerns. So I'm confident that after tonight's talk, our knowledge will be greatly enhanced regarding the problems with Lady Meacher's bill, thanks to Tani's wisdom and insight. Before Tani begins, Bishop Patrick has asked me to read a short statement. Dear Baroness Gray Thompson, I am so grateful to you for accepting the invitation to speak by means of Zoom to the Nottingham Diocese this evening. I am truly sorry that my diocesan commitments prevent me from joining everyone in listening now to your talk. I am therefore very grateful that you have given permission for it to be recorded. I look forward to listening to it as soon as possible. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your work over many years as a disability rights campaigner who has courageously fought against disability discrimination. I thank you also for your work and witness within the House of Lords. I'm very grateful for what you will share with those listening to your talk this evening. We are aware that you have serious concerns, as do many of us, about the Meacher Bill and its ramifications for both disabled people and our wider society. So may I once again express my personal gratitude to you for the stance you're taking and the courage of your convictions. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'll now hand over to Baroness Gray Thompson. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Madeline, for that introduction. And if you could also pass on my thanks to Bishop Patrick as well. Uh, he did communicate with me a little while ago that uh, he's got other pressing business to attend to tonight. Um, and thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us on a Thursday night in what is a very emotive and um, difficult issue. So as Madeline said, uh, we've got the Meacher Bill that is uh, coming to us in October. Uh, it's uh, another iteration of the Faulkner Bill that uh, we did in 2017. And there's been numerous attempts to uh, change the law. Uh, in 2015, there's been a number of uh, different debates uh, through 2017, 2019, um, and now uh, the Meacher Bill. So I come to my view on uh, not being in favour of changing the law from several different perspectives. One, absolutely, as a disabled person who experiences various different levels of discrimination, I'm treated very three very distinct ways. Once, one is an ex-athlete, which is generally quite nice. One is a parliamentarian, which is quite mixed. People either like me or don't like me. And the third way is a disabled woman where I do experience a reasonable amount of discrimination. And it's that sort of third way that I'm treated that, that worries me about how, if this legislation's passed, how disabled people could be encouraged to think um, about ending their lives. The other way I come to it is as a parliamentarian and a lot of what we have to do is look at unforeseen consequences. So we have legislation presented to us. It is our job uh, to improve it and to try and make it better. But with both the Faulkner Bill and the Meacher Bill, um, they're very thin on the ground and they don't provide an awful lot of detail in terms of what, when, and how. And my concern with um, it passing through Parliament in the time that we have available to us, we can't get into a debate or sort some of these issues out. And what I've been told by Dignity and Diane is just we'll get the legislation through and then we'll work out the consequences after. And I'm never very comfortable doing that on any piece of legislation, let alone uh, a piece of legislation that ends with someone's death because there's no way back there there isn't any way to to investigate uh the safeguards that we've been told will be put in the bill 
um, are so vague, they don't offer me uh, any reassurance whatsoever. So um, I've been uh, publicly involved in this debate for about the last 11 years. And I felt um, quite strongly that while I was competing, that uh, with Paralympic athlete, that I shouldn't have a very public view on politics. Um, but I've always been very interested uh, in disability rights. Uh, I work in areas of domestic violence and uh, for about the last eight or nine years, worked in the area of coercive and controlling behaviour and safeguarding and duty of care in sport. So I recognise I bring a mixture of personal views to this, um, of which I'm going to talk about tonight, but also with my you know, legislative hat on the challenges that, that we face. And if you'd asked me 20 years ago what I thought, uh, I think I was more likely to say, um, yes, people should be allowed to have choice. But choice is um, a really difficult thing because actually very few people have real and genuine choice in the things that they do with their lives. And one of the challenges of the legislation uh, in terms of there's lots of sound bites from the people who want to change the law. And sadly, the answers to those questions are not sound bites back. They're the conversation that I'm having with you tonight. And really, it's, you know, when I spent more time um, researching this, speaking to people who are in favour of changing the law, uh, people who've been affected by this, um, I, I've sort of arrived at the conclusion that uh, this is not the right time or place to change the law. One thing we know is it's deeply held and emotive issues. The challenge we have in terms of uh, people who are on my side of, of the argument is that most people don't want to raise their head above the parapet until the legislation is right in front of us. And one of the challenges is most people don't want to talk about death. I certainly don't. People um, are maybe happy to talk about their, um, their wishes for their funeral or what happens afterwards. But actually the process of dying is really, really difficult to talk about. So when the pollsters ask questions like, should somebody be able to have a good death? Of course, the answer is yes. And then the next question is, should assisted suicide be legal to ensure a good death? People will say yes. The reality is an awful lot of people, uh, and, and for very sensible reasons, don't think about the who, when, where, how. Um, and it's only when those points are interrogated with individuals and the follow-up questions are much more around, you know, who, when, where, where, why, that people then say, actually, this is not the right thing to do. It's, it's rather like the death penalty question. People think it's all very sensible until you start saying, well, what happens if you get it wrong? And there are jurisdictions around the world that have got it wrong. So um, it's not it's not um, a simple answer to, to to sort of try and combat these these very simple um, questions that are given to us. Uh, I have to say one thing is that I'm I'm often asked and is often thrown back is well it's only religious people that want to change the law, um, and I found that not to be the case. What I have found to be the case is um, friends of mine who have faith. Um, spend more time interrogating these deep moral uh, and ethical issues and come to it from um, a slightly different point. Um, so for me, it is a moral issue about how do we want to treat people in society and what do we want to do in terms of um, helping people through? Because there is no doubt that those people who want to change law have deeply emotive uh, and personal testimonies. And I've been told that I'm heartless, I'm cruel, and I want people to have a terrible death. I absolutely do not want to do that. But the reality is, is those stories do pull on people's heartstrings and do um, make people often, not always, give a very sort of simple answer of yes, assisted suicide should be allowed. One of the things that we're seeing at the moment as well is that um, it often gets thrown into a debate of palliative care 
and whether there should be better palliative care or what process palliative care has in this. And I think it's really important to take a step back as yes, there should be more investment in palliative care because the reality is it is a postcode lottery and it can be very difficult and very complicated. But I don't believe it should be a choice of palliative care or assisted suicide. And changing the law is not the answer to some of the issues that exist within palliative care. And what we've seen in jurisdictions around the world, such as Oregon, where it's legal, is that assisted suicide is offered um, instead of cancer treatments. So where insurance schemes kick in and um, they are expensive and the person doesn't have the right insurance, they're offered the medication to end their lives. And there are numerous cases of this. So um, one of the things that is levelled at us is that uh, the law is not compassionate and we are not compassionate people. But um, I think the current law, it, it's not perfect but it works uh, relatively well in terms of the Crown Prosecution Service will investigate and make a decision on whether somebody has uh, assisted in a suicide very genuinely for genuine reasons or has uh, been involved in murdering somebody. Uh, and there are very, very few cases of prosecutions. And one of the things that, again, we're accused of that people, um, you know, are dying in pain or they're committing suicide and that, you know, that there are lots of people who, who want to go to Dignitas. Well, in 2019, 42 British people went to Dignitas. Um, this is also an unbelievably complicated argument um, because actually, you know, Dignitas is not cheap to go to. So that there is a barrier in terms of that. Um, and I feel sometimes like I, I argue against myself in terms of it. But um, I think in terms of the compassion that currently exists within the law, I think it actually does, you know, make quite sensible decisions in terms of, of, of looking at cases. So I mentioned before that the bill is very short and uh, I don't believe that it's our job to fix all the wrongs that are in the bill. But what it is basically asking for is somebody who has a six month prognosis, uh, two medical people uh, will make an assessment of that individual and the individual has a settled wish uh, to end their lives. So we know prognosis is really difficult. Uh, I uh, we, we all have probably can name cases of somebody who's been given a short prognosis and has, has lived a lot longer. But um, I've I've made it my job to um, talk to a, a number of, of quite a few palliative care doctors uh, and other doctors to ask about prognosis. And every single one says it's really difficult to do that. You're making the best judgment call that you can. When we look at the two professionals that would be involved, um, it's very difficult to understand about whether there would be a conscience clause. And there's uh, uh, an amount of research that out there that shows that there are doctors who think that the law should change. And there are various polls on this through the, the different uh, medical colleges. But when you ask those closest to dying people, palliative care doctors, they don't want it. They don't think um, it's an option because they have that experience and the knowledge um, to bring to it. The other area is, is that settled wish. Um, how are we going to measure it? Uh, what will it cost? Uh, how can you ensure there is no coercion? And one of my colleagues said um, in the 2017 debate, where there's a will, there's a relative. Uh, and for me, that was um, a very interesting statement to make in terms of um, people's motivation for um, encouraging this. We've seen in Holland uh, not that long ago where uh, somebody, uh, a woman had had a directive about her end of life, but when questioned said, no, she wasn't ready to end her life at that moment in time. And her family disagreed and they took her out for coffee 
and they put some of the medication into her coffee and she was then later held down uh, and drugged against her will. Um, and so, so some of these cases do very, very much worry me because the power of some family members to become involved and not do it. You, you hope your family members love you and care about you and want to do the right thing. But but that is is not always the case. So when we talk about assisted suicide, the view that is often given that if somebody requests assisted suicide, it's this lovely Hollywood death where somebody slips away and it's painless. Um, and we know that not to be the case. Um, there are numerous cases of people waking up from taking the drugs or taking um, several days to die or one case where the patient didn't die. So um, this is not in the UK. A nurse put a plastic bag over the patient's head to end their life. The other thing that we have never got into publicly in a debate, uh, and I think we are going to have to do that, is to talk about the drugs that will be used to end a person's life, whether they're going to be administered, um, in what form they're going to be administered, whether it's intravenous, whether the person has any involvement uh, in that. But there are no trials for these drugs. Um, they're drugs that are used on death row uh, uh, inmates. Uh, and there are a number of cases where they haven't worked. And what we're also seeing in various jurisdictions is they're just mixing up batches of drugs to because they they guess that is what will will end somebody's life. And in a number of cases, those drugs are quite expensive. So now there's experimentation going on with cheaper drugs uh, to, to make it easier. So this is not something where you can run a trial. And once somebody has died, you can't ask them what their death was like and whether they experienced any pain. So it is a misnomer that it's this Hollywood death and that it all um, kind of slips away. Um, coming back to the, the doctors about who will do it, is it going to be a doctor? Is it going to be a nurse? Um, will it be someone who is specifically trained to do this? Actually, what um, support is going to be put in place for the people who will do this procedure? And, and what a lot of us feel is that it will fundamentally change your relationship with the doctor if you know that this is something that they offer. Again, in the States, we do see doctor shopping in terms of... Um, the, the assessment process and people being encouraged to jump around to find different doctors who uh, be willing to do it. Um, so in a lot of cases uh, in other jurisdictions where there is various forms of assisted suicide, then pain is very, very low on the list of why people request it. Being a burden is really high on the list and people thinking of their families and thinking of you know other things the other thing i think that we have to challenge is that where will this happen um i think for a while a lot of people thought dignitas was this lovely cottage somewhere in the swiss alps it's an aircraft hangar um and you know will the drugs be available um in a facility will there be a, and it kind of comes back to what the drugs are Will they be available um, to take home, as in Oregon? What measurement will there be of those drugs? What we now know uh, about Oregon, which um, massively concerns me, uh, and I was concerned before when you're given the drugs and you can take them home and you know you, you can then choose your point to, to take them. But actually, in Oregon, on the death certificate, if you've taken end-of-life drugs, it's put down as natural causes. So it is nowhere recorded what the death is. And that really worries me because those who want to change the law keep saying, oh, well, there's, there's no bad stories come out of Oregon. There's no, um, uh, there's no evidence of coercion. But if the death, death certificate doesn't contain how somebody died, then actually that isn't going to be followed up. And then the other issue with somewhere like Oregon, which the Meacher bill is quite often compared to, to Oregon, um, they, they only keep the data for a year after somebody's died and then the records are destroyed. So there is no way of going back 
to keep track of that. And the other thing to remember about Oregon, which is really important when numbers are given out about how many people die in Oregon from assisted suicide. Oregon is a really small state. It is tiny um, compared to other states. So if you um, extrapolate the data from Oregon and then bring it to the UK, you're talking uh, potentially about many thousands of deaths a year, not just uh, a couple of hundred. And the honest answer is we, 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 we don't know how many people would request this. Some people say that they would like the option of requesting it to, to make them feel comfortable and to, to give them choice at their end of life. But we, we don't know. So as much as I, I can't say it's, could, I don't know, it could be tens of thousands. Um, those on the other side can't say that it's only going to be 10 or 20 or, or 30. We don't know. And I'm very uncomfortable about bringing the legislation in to then figure about how many people might choose to, um, to die in, in this way. So there are lots of questions that still um, remain unanswered. And I do think it's important to look at the other jurisdictions to, to understand what is happening in, in other places. Um, and I don't think you can look at uh, the Meacher Bill in isolation of other countries. So probably Netherlands and Belgium are some of the better known countries um, in terms of uh, their legislation. In Netherlands, uh, it's legal if the person is enduring unbearable suffering and there's no prospect of improvement. But that's really hard to measure as well. Also, uh, the Netherlands permits euthanasia. Anyone from the age of 12 can request it, but parental consent is required if a child is um, under 16. Um, the doctor must consult with at least one other independent doctor, but that means that the doctor doesn't necessarily know anything about you or understand why you're requesting this. Um, and it's interesting that in Netherlands that it's been allowed since 1981, um, but was um, only legalized in 2002. Um, according to data that goes back to 2017, uh, the Regional Euthanasia Review Committee said that there were six and a half thousand cases of euthanasia, uh, and that's 96 of the overall total of assisted suicide. So, you know, a country the size of the Netherlands, it's, it's actually starting to, to increase the numbers um, quite a lot. Um, the largest proportion of cases um, involve people with cancer, uh, about 70%, 4% uh, are due to dementia. But again, talking to uh, various doctors, it's looking about what alternative treatments are available, palliative care, you know, you, you don't have to kill the patient to kill the symptoms. And the, the huge majority of pain can be relieved. It's actually about getting that right palliative care um, into place. Belgium worries me for, for different reasons. Um, so again, they um, permit euthanasia uh, for a child. They have to be um, terminally ill. Um, there's no age restrictions in Belgium, but a child must ask for the procedure and must fully understand with the consent of their parents. Again, that's been legal um, since 2002. Quite often it's for terminal illness. Um, and there, the palliative care system is integrated with the option of medically assisted dying. The worrying bit for me um, in Belgium is that 32% are carried out without request of the individual. And this is the slippery slope that we, we, we talk about is that once you open the door, where does it end? And um, in um, Flanders, 47% of it goes unreported. Um, and nurses regularly carry it out, which is illegal, but there's been no attempt to um, prosecute uh, any of those nurses. Uh, Canada is one of the most recent countries that have gone down this route, and they call it MAID, Medical Aid in Dying, which I think is meant to sound um, nicer. But what we've seen in uh, Canada is that as soon as the legislation came in, there was a, a very strong push to, to open it and to make it wider almost immediately. And um, 
there's a number of um, institutions there that are being threatened with being defunded. Hospices are being threatened with being defunded if they don't offer it, even though there might be a hospital just down the road uh, that offers it. Uh, and, and Canada is worrying for other reasons in terms of they're pushing and pushing to, to make it um, incredibly wide. Um, Colombia is an, a jurisdiction we don't really talk about um, and um, they also permit euthanasia. Uh, there you, you can request it from the age of seven and you only need parental consent up until the age of 14. But it's interesting, um, not, not many deaths are registered in Colombia between 50, 2015 and 2019, it's only 38. But it's the only country that requires prior approval of euthanasia requests by an independent committee. Um, and between the Faulkner Bill and the, sorry, in, in terms of when the Faulkner Bill, uh, they attempted to get it through, one of the additions to that was to um, bring in high court um, decision making powers to check whether um, a, a person had um, genuinely requested it. It, it does just, you know, the capacity of uh, the High Court to do that or whether cases would even get to the High Court, again, are um, cause for concern. And on the surface, it makes it look like something is happening and that there is a level of safeguarding. But I'm not sure that I'm, I'm not convinced that that level of, of safeguarding um, is there. And the final jurisdiction um, I'm going to talk about is Switzerland, seen as you know, I've previously talked um, uh, about Dignitas. So it's interestingly that it's not actually, it's, um, it's permitted in Switzerland, not because laws have been passed, but because they have no laws to prohibit it. And their numbers um, are rising. Assisted suicide rose from 187 in 2003 to 965 in 2015, and they continue to rise. And it is the only country so far uh, to offer assistance um, to foreign nationals. Um, there are jurisdictions closer to home that are looking at it. So Jersey is currently um, going through uh, a debate about whether to allow it. And uh, I gave evidence to uh, a people's committee um, a couple of months ago. And one of the things they're debating as well is whether they only want it to be available to residents of Jersey. Uh, it hasn't got into the, the legal system or whether they would um, want to open themselves up to accepting foreign nationals. But again, with Jersey, um, if you have enough money in the bank account, uh, you can afford to live there. So again, that's a slightly strange form of discrimination that I'm arguing about. But um, it's interesting that actually of all the countries that offer it, Switzerland is the only one that will do it um, for for foreign nationals. So um, I realise I'm kind of talking at you um, quite a lot and um, I'm, I'm really happy to answer questions on that. I think where I've kind of leave this is that um, there is no right to be killed. There, there is no right to uh, currently involve somebody in uh, your death. There is a massive danger of slippery slope um, and opening the doors to voluntary euthanasia and assisted suicide I absolutely do believe it could lead to non-voluntary and involuntary uh, deaths um, because you're giving doctors the power to decide whether a patient's life is worth living or not and um, I don't believe that we can control it and the assumption that somebody should have the right to die would actually impose on doctors a duty to kill and thus restricting you know the autonomy of doctors and i also believe that having a right to die for some people might well become a duty to die so in uh, holland you can request it at the age of 70 if you're just tired of life uh, and that is something that that kind of is um sort of encouraged if if you become tired of life um final couple of things that 
I, I want to say is um, author George Pitcher stated that any change in the law would have, and I quote, profound adverse effects on the social fabric of our society, on our attitudes towards each other's deaths and illnesses, on our attitudes towards those who are ill and those who are disabled. Uh, the uh, 1994 report by the House Lords Select Committee on Medical Ethics found that it was virtually impossible to ensure that all acts of euthanasia were truly voluntary and that any liberalisation of the law in the United Kingdom um, could be abused. Um, and they also stated they were concerned vulnerable people, elderly, lonely, sick or distressed, would, would very much feel pressure, whether real or imagined, to uh, request that early death. So, um, we have the battle, and, and I, I, I call it that, coming up. It starts the end of October. How far the legislation gets, um, we don't know. Uh, and um, I know that we, we do have a lot of support in the chamber, but uh, also, if you're minded to, we could really do with your support in terms of writing to peers uh, and at the moment peers, MPs potentially later on in terms of giving your views. Um, for peers, it does make a difference. Um, and um, yeah, I'm going to leave it there before I continue waffling on anymore. Um, thank you very much for your time tonight. And I'm really happy to answer any questions that you have. And the other thing I'm going to put in my uh, in the chat box, I'm going to put my email address. So if anybody would like to follow up with me afterwards, um, I'd be really happy to do so. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Tani. That was fascinating. Um, I'm going to just go through um, some questions now, which have um, come up. The first one is a, a good a good practical point. Um, who should we contact in the House of Lords to um, ask them to vote the Meacher Bill down? Because obviously with MPs, you contact your local MP, but yes. is it a case of should people write to every single uh, peer in the, in the House of Lords? Um, I wouldn't suggest writing to every single peer um, because I think there's 700 of us. Um, so that's a lot of letters. <laughs> but... Um, you can look on um, the House of Lords website and you can do a search for assisted dying debates um, and you can see the names of people who have spoken for or against. What I would say sometimes it's really lovely to get even a short line to say, yes, keep going or we agree with you. Um, we, we used to get in quite strongly worded emails saying that we don't, people don't agree with us. Um, but that's probably the quickest way um, to, to, to look at who's for and against and, and who to, to write to. But the personal experience is is really important. And you may have seen that um, Lord Carey, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, has had an article in the, the BMJ um, and is obviously a staunch a supporter of a change in the law. Um, and someone's asked um, if you had any views on what he had to say. In, in summary, you may not have seen it, but he said, there's nothing holy about dying in agony. Um, and I just wondered if you had any comments on that, Tani. Yeah, so um, it was kind of interesting with Lord Kerry. Um, so I think quite a few people have called him a maverick, you know, who stood outside uh, the tradition of his own church and, and Christianity generally. Um, I mean, it comes back to people can have um, a personal uh, opinion on this and, um, I obviously I don't agree with him, but um, I kind of defend his right to have um, a personal opinion. But I think it just makes it um, just too binary that assisted suicide is a good death and dying naturally is a bad death. And um, it's 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 just not the case. Um, I I've lost both my parents. Uh, uh, I wasn't with my mum when she passed. I was with my dad, um, and it was about having the right support at the right time. To make it okay but I, I know this sounds really harsh but one thing we all know is going to happen to us and actually i think we need to have much more open discussions um about what it is and how it happens and support through that so um it's it's quite interesting you know lord lord carry's view on it but um 
yeah I, I i don't agree with the it's not simple the fact i've been talking at you for the last half an hour um and there is probably like another hour i could talk to you about different things it, it it's not that simple as as just a good or a bad death and one one is you know assisted suicide good and natural is bad um well the, the next question sort of follows on from that point somebody's asked um it seems that people that want assisted dying um might not might not have engaged with palliative care mm. and how can we how can we change that we we do need better palliative care um across the country absolutely definitely um i think it's something that's underfunded and not necessarily um always um understood and it's really difficult i mean if we look now at the moment with um you know the impact of covid on the nhs there's going to be more challenges um to finance um i was looking at some research in terms of um people who've had covid and had it very badly in terms of um the impact and whether they're requesting assisted suicide and, and it, it doesn't appear to be um changing the numbers so i think there's some really interesting work that we need to do around that in terms of of drilling down into that i think there's a lot of scare tactics um around in terms of um that that bad death and and cancer and, lo and lots of other things around that which is 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 also um quite worrying that uh that you know if if you request this you'll have a, a good death um and, and if you don't have it, it'll be bad. Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Because I'm, I'm very conscious I was starting to go off on a tangent. But just essentially is it would, the people that are asking for assisted dying, um, you know, perhaps they're not actually engaging in the question yes. of palliative care. Thank uh, you. Because it's interesting that people that often talk about wanting assisted dying are sometimes people who are, you know, not actually terminally ill, that they're, they're already yes. thinking ahead. Um, yes. So Thank you. Thank you for getting me back on track. Yeah, I mean, the, the other thing that's really interesting is that what people are scared of. So somebody who's in change or if, in favour of change law said to me, um, well, I just don't want to be incontinent. That is like the worst thing they that could ever happen to them. And apologies for this, but it is 10 past eight on a Thursday. Um, so I've got spina bifida, I'm paralysed from the waist down. I'm technically incontinent. You know, so if I didn't catheterize and I didn't use suppositories, I would. Be. But you can manage it. You know, I I wouldn't choose to catheterize, but it's it's not it's not the worst thing in my life by any stretch. So it's interesting what people think are the worst things in their lives. I also, you know, had somebody say to me, "If my my life was like yours, I'd kill myself." You know, okay. Um, I got to be a Paralympian and travel the world for twenty five years, and now I'm in a parli parliament and I'm relatively well protected. So. Um, I, I think talking about some of those issues in terms of trying to find solutions, because actually for a lot of these things, there are solutions. Um, it's just sometimes you might know, not know what, what they are. Um, and I think, I think people are very much affected if a family member has had a bad death. I really do. I think that, that, that seems to weigh on, on a lot of people. Um. And uh, someone else has asked a question um, saying that they live in Scotland and over there legislators are talking about involving a judge in the process. Um, from what I understand, that's also a so-called safeguarding yes. in Baroness Meacher's bill. Um, do you have anything to say about that, Tani? Would it just be a rubber stamp exercise? I, th I think it it wouldn't quite it wouldn't be quite a rubber stamp and you could argue that certain divisions um of the high court or different jurisdictions you know have expertise in this what's interesting is anytime it's gone um to the high court they've thrown it back and said it's a decision for parliament not for them and then i think you'd have to think about a conscience clause for judges as well in terms of whether that is something that they would um, potentially want to be involved in or not. It's then down to the information that's presented within that court case and whether, you know, it's, it's that coercion. Will, will a judge during that case have the ability to ascertain whether that person has a genuine free and settled wish or they've been coerced over a period of time 
to say that's what they want. And, and that's the challenge in terms of time, effort and cost um, that we, you know, it, it, it could take months to do those proper assessments and how well does, you know, the, the medical professions need to, to know the person. Um, I was just reading some data earlier in, uh, I think it's Oregon again, some of the doctors who are making the decisions to, to give drugs may only have contact with a patient for six to eight weeks. And um, Baroness Campbell of Surbiton uh, said in, in a debate, you know, she if she wanted to convince uh, a doctor that she had a free and subtle wish to end life, she could do it very easily. You know, it, it, it wouldn't be a difficult thing to do. So it's it's having the time to, to make that valid judgment about whether it's free choice or not. So ultimately, I'm not sure the, the court would be able to give enough time. The other thing, sorry, that didn't mention was the Mental Capacity Act hasn't been fully enforced. So there's lots of things within that that need to be much, much stronger before we could, I think we can even start arguing about this. And um, I think there's a tiny part of me that could convince myself it's a really good idea that at, at a point in time, but the, the um, the opportunity for um, making mistakes, for coercive control, for just um, pushing people to this and, and giving people the best chance of their life for as long as they can, um, it just, just makes me, me really worried. And talking to um, Laura Baroness Finley about this, she's a palliative care doctor, so she has lots of examples of different things where she said, um, you know, there, there are moments where a family will be appear to be very kind and caring and lovely uh, and then you never see them because the patients turn 70 and their life insurance has run out and and things like this you know and you know everyone can produce anecdotal stories but you know it, it's just it's again and again and again that, that there's too many things to worry about uh, oh sorry to I've got Jacqueline on my screen and she's put, sorry to jump in on you, Madeline, but she's put up a hand and she's right in front of me on, on the screen. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Sorry. Hello. Um, I've worked uh, with older people for an extended period of time. And <clears throat> on a personal level, I have seen people <clears throat> in a excuse me, in a general hospital mm. who have come in and appeared to be end of life and three weeks later have walked out quite happily, but they've been very determined. Mm. And I've also seen ladies, bear in mind it was 30 years ago, um, a lady of my age at the time mm. came in and had um, a bilateral mastectomy and decided that she couldn't live with that mm. and died. And there was nothing else there was no reason for her to die other than she chose to. And I appreciate that we're not all as strong-willed or strong-minded. I, I could go on forever anecdotally telling you about people who have um, lived unexpectedly and died unexpectedly. Yep. The other point is that I've put in the question I was around when they, they um, debated the abortion bill and the abortion bill was incredibly protective. It was two independent doctors and um, emergency circumstances for extreme circumstances. And it's taken 20 odd years and it's nothing like that. But having worked with older people and been aware of how very caring relatives um, then appear not to be, and in fact can be very men menacing, um, I would be very, very loath for any of this to happen. It's, if you look at the comparison between this bill and the abortion bill, and we'll see how long it is before you get to pension age and a pill. Unfortunately, I believe that's the way it's going to go. And I'm a rheumatoid with bad lungs and all sorts of things. 
that I'm living my life and I intend to. And I, and I do volunteer in a hospice and I intend to do that for as long as I possibly can. I don't want somebody to say, oh, by the way, you're now 75, there's your pill, off you go. And I, I believe that that's what this bill is going to do. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, sorry, Madeline. I just... Um, I'm sorry, sorry I, I was in. having a rant. No, <laughs> no, ranting's good. Thank you. M Madeline, are there any other questions? Um, oh. Yeah, there is someone saying, I'm very concerned uh, about domestic abuse and coercive control. Yeah. Um, and they're asking what action or research is being undertaken to address this? Um, so we, before summer recess, we did domestic violence uh, legislation, uh, domestic abuse legislation, sorry I meant to call it, um, and a, a lot of that was looking at um, coercive control um, and in terms of, um, oh, I could go off and have another tangent here about that, uh, and, and certainly around disabled people, we had a very interesting debate with the government where they didn't want us to introduce um, personal care, personal carers in domestic abuse legislation because they said it wasn't an intimate relationship. And if you're being washed and taken to the toilet and all sorts of things by a carer, then that is fairly intimate. But um, we, we see massive um, number of cases of coercive control, um, many cases men against women, but, but it's, it's far more complicated than that. Um, so you kind of would expect there to be a degree of coercive control in terms of that and in terms of just drip feeding over a period of time and encouraging people that th this is what they should do. And I don't, we I haven't looked at this in a lot of detail yet, but in terms of people's life insurance and things like that, that also needs to be looked at in terms of the benefit, you know, where is the beneficiary? Um, so some jurisdictions, you know, are very kind of strict on, on the beneficiary side of it. But that's there's nothing that I'm aware of in, in the bill that, that covers that. And, and that's sort of slightly worrying. It comes back to my where there's a will, there's a relative. Um, I actually did have somebody who wrote to me who said they wanted their grandmother to think about this. Um, and they hoped I'd change my mind because they wanted to sell a house. I was like, wow, you wrote that to me. Wow. I mean, that that was sort of quite terrifying, really. But um, yeah, we, we, we would expect there to be a degree of coercive control within it. Um, um, a new comment here. Um, I'm 65. I currently have bladder cancer for the sixth time. Because of this, I have been incontinent for the last 10 years. Yes, it depresses me at times, but I really would not want someone to offer assisted suicide when I'm on a bad day. My life is worth so much more. Um, thank you very much for that, for that comment and for, for sharing that. Um, 